Welcome to Eric's Perspective. Joining me today is the director of the Los Angeles County Department of Arts and Culture, Kristen Sakota. Kristen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Eric. I'm really happy to be here. Excellent, excellent. So I'm sitting in the gallery here in Fullerton, and Kristen is in L.A., so mindful of the pandemic situation and, of course, the distance between the two of us. So we're able to, thanks to technology, conduct it this way. So, again, once again, thanks a lot. So, Kristen, before we get into the department itself, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about you. Uh, how did you get started in the arts, if you wouldn't mind telling us, and uh, give us a little bit of your own personal background. Sure, absolutely, happy to. You know, for me, the arts were part of my life from a really early age. Um, I mean, in so many ways, I feel like I gravitated towards it, but I also just completely lucked out. When I was young, we grew up uh, in Chicago, and we were on the south side of Chicago at that time, Hyde Park. And I have two older sisters. And at a certain point, my parents realized that given, given the school system, given everything happening at that time, so this is the early 70s, that they wanted to move us uh, to ensure that they could have better a better life for all of us, mm -hmm. right? And so we moved from the south side of Chicago into the very first suburb you hit west. You literally, everything's on a grid. So you literally cross the street from an area of Chicago called Austin uh, into what is called Oak Park. Oak Park, Illinois, which oh. is a suburb that's known for not only being that kind of picturesque idea of sort of the white picket fences and all that, mm -hmm. but really steeped in art and architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright had a studio there, built several homes there, and there was a wonderful ballet school there. And my older sisters started taking ballet and I said, I wanted to do that too. And so at about age four or five, my mom enrolled me in the ballet school. And the rest, as they say, is sort of history. I fell in love with it. It ended up being kind of the only thing I really stuck with. I had like little moments of, you know, Suzuki violin or piano that I like did terribly at or didn't <laughs> practice, but dance. And the fact that really a love of music could be expressed through dance, ah. that friends and a community can come through dance, mm -hmm. um, really became a big part of my life. And so from that early age, I uh, then I can't kind of can't believe that this is true, but it really is only a few years later when I was seven, I was performing professionally as a child dancer in the big Chicago Nutcracker. The Nutcracker is a huge thing, right? In in ballet and in the, yeah. in the season, uh, holiday season. And there's this huge place that was called Airy Crown, uh -huh. regional, like thousand, like ten thousand seats. And wow. there was a professional uh, dance performance and season of the Nutcracker there with professional dancers and children. And you had to audition all that. And I started performing professionally at about seven and did that for uh, a few years as well. So it really became a big part of my life through through dance um, but what's funny about it is at that time i was not thinking that it was something i was going to do as a career hmm. even though i had friends in ballet i just i will never forget this my friend tanya weidman is her name and i remember her saying we were kids right learning point you know getting our first point shoes and all that saying i'm going to be the first black ballerina she's an african-american girl uh -huh. uh, dark skinned girl and uh and I just thought, wow, that's amazing. But it was did not occur to me that I wanted to be a dancer or that I was going to do something professionally in the arts at all. Uh -huh. um, and years later, she did. She went on to Dance Theater of Harlem. She still uh, teaches uh, ballet. She's known many dance companies, choreography and the like. Uh, but I later, after continuing with dance and performing arts, musical theater, singing, uh, songwriting, all throughout college, it wasn't until I was graduating college and thinking about law school that I was like, you know what? I started dancing with a new choreographer and I realized I want to try this professionally as a career, even if it's just for a short period of time after, after school. And so it really took all the way until way later to move forward with it in that way. And then it was even after that and after I did become a lawyer that I started to understand the whole realm of arts administration. 
I and see. that you could actually meld these different things together. And that's how I eventually uh, came to where I am today. So you danced professionally, though, beyond being a child uh, performer, but as an adult. So where was that? Was that also in the Chicago area? That's true. Uh, yes. Yeah. So no, um, actually, none of that was in Chicago. Uh, that was later on. So I went to when I went to college, um, I went to Stanford. I, it was the first time I was ever in California and uh, eventually started dancing with a, a choreographer named Robert Moses. He still has a dance company in the Bay Area called Robert Moses Kin. He's an amazing choreographer, African-American. Uh, and I started dancing. I was one of his founding uh, dance company members. And after I graduated school, I, I decided I'm going to take a break. I am not going to go to law school right away. And I danced with his dance company in San Francisco. And it was sort of small pickup pick up work and performances while you juggled other, other jobs, as often it is in the arts. Yeah. And there was this seminal moment when I decided I was going to take this trip to New York City and visit a friend and stay with a friend. And while I was there, I was doing the trip to coincide with a workshop that the Urban Bushwomen, the dance company Urban Bushwomen was host, hosting. That was a week long workshop and audition. So you got to take dance class daily. And at the end of it, they were going to identify uh, someone, you know, that they wanted to join the dance company. Well, I had seen Urban Bushwomen because they came to college, to the college where I was, mm -hmm. and they did it. I did a workshop with them and they performed and they were just in Incredible. I'd never seen anything like that. That integration of African American uh, uh, perspective of music, drumming, and dance from the African diaspora mixed with contemporary dance. Oh. And so I thought, well, this is amazing. How fun! I'll go do this trip. It'll be it'll be wonderful. I didn't know <laughs> that the company had had a, a big turnover, and they were they needed to hire almost an entire full company. And I went and through the entire process, made it, made it all the way down to the end. And at the end of that two weeks, I was one of, I think, six of us invited to join the Urban Bushwomen and was essentially like, great, you've got, you know, three weeks, turn around, go pack your bags, go back to San Francisco. We'll see you back in New York. And this is the August, August of 1996. Oh, wow. And so I, that is what actually brought me to New York, which I had always dreamed of, but never really knew that I would do. As a, as a dancer, uh -huh. modern dancer, found my little apartment, my roommate situation in Clinton Hill, Brooklyn, <laughs> and then danced uh, with the amazing Urban Bushwomen. Uh, and it was after that that essentially I, I had done musical theater in, um, in essentially junior high, high school mm -hmm. and college and decided, well, now I'm in the like pinnacle of like, you know, Broadway and everything. I, I'm going to start auditioning. And I started going to open calls and all that. And that's how I landed later the national tour of rent ah. and, uh, and, and other musical theater. I was also in, in shows off Broadway, uh, something called the wild party. I was in a, a very brief stint in, <laughs> in a revival of um, for colored girls that happened off Broadway at that time. Um, and then later began my journey to say, okay, am I actually picking up the thread of law school? And by the time I picked up the thread of law school, uh, that thread, I knew I was doing it because I wanted to stay and bring that skill to the realm of arts and entertainment. And along the way, before I could even finish that uh, thought, I did one more like key audition, which was the um, original Broadway cast of Mamma Mia. And I landed, I said, I can't turn this down. This is my one chance to be on Broadway. <laughs> and I was in the original cast uh, of Mamma Mia on Broadway. And then um, went back and, and did my law degree and from then on married that with the arts and uh, becoming an arts arts administrator um, and uh, and then built out my career from sort of a theater a place of really theater and performing arts uh, into then the public sector with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. Ah, interesting. So yeah. did you ever feel the impulse after getting into the administrative side? Did you ever feel a pull to go back into the performing side? Yes, I will say, and I just had this conversation with someone so funny uh, who runs a, an extremely notable <laughs> uh, foundation and organization here in Los Angeles who said when she got her job to lead this incredible thing, she said the one thing she couldn't stop thinking is, wow, I guess I'm really going to be an executive and not an artist anymore. 
<laughs> I believe once an artist, you're kind of always an artist right. somewhere in you. Yeah. And so there certainly were some years where it felt like a t- war, like which, which one am I doing? Am I going to try to juggle both? But being an artist and doing it well and successfully takes, takes so much, every fiber of your being. Yeah. And it takes, you know, the dedication and the day to day. And you can't be also, in my opinion, in my experience, you can't really stretch that with something else. And so absolutely at some point there was a full pivot into actually this is extremely rewarding and actually the level of impact I can have, not just as the person on the stage, but as the person that funds the entire uh, organization or the entire field Mm -hmm. or who's setting cultural policy or cultural legislation that started to really draw me in Uh when I started to see that there was an entire uh, field of all the folks who really make the art happen and provide a lot of the support and a lot of the uh, policy and program de- design to support the vision of, of visionary artists and organizations and that that was actually an incredible path to follow as well. Fantastic. And that's such an important component. I mean, uh, like you said, uh, the artist has to devote him or herself almost fully to their art. And uh, that doesn't leave much time or energy to devote to the other things, to keep it going and to make, make it happen. So your, while you were in law school, by the way, did you have a focus? Uh, I know probably in law school there are certain fundamental things you have to take that are generic to whatever branch of the law you plan, plan to pursue. But did you uh, have a specific focus uh, in law school uh, for the arts? I did. I you know, it's not uh, something you can sort of choose to specialize in as a as an actual, you know, it's not like an undergraduate major kind of a thing. Right. But you can make your own path. And so in addition to all of the uh, sort of yeah grounding legal studies that you would do, I did everything. I did intellectual property. I did copyright. I did trademark. I did film law. I did tax exempt organizations, so essentially nonprofit organizations. Uh, the law and governance of them. Uh, so I, I did, <laughs> I did whatever I could, and I interned. I interned. Um, I was really. It's interesting. I was really open to both what we think of as kind of the nonprofit art sector, philanthropy, etc. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially having come from the modern dance world um, and the nonprofit theater world, but I was also really open to true what we would consider entertainment and sort of the, the, uh, the broader creative economy side. I interned at Arista Records in business and legal oh, wow. at the time uh-huh. in New York. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, really was open to that. I also interned, oh yeah, this is like just coming to me. I also interned for Londell McMillan, who is a, an attorney who has managed people like Prince uh, and other <laughs> major artists. Oh my goodness. So, yeah, so, so- I, I, I explored things. I actually even did a stint at, um, International Creative Management, ICM, uh-huh. at the time, their New York office. So so the side of being a manager, and I worked with a literary manager whose role was to take her clients' amazing stories and narratives and literature and help them get deals to turn them into TV shows and film. Oh. Uh, so I've seen a lot of different aspects of the, of the business from being an, an art law you know, specialist to working on the public sector, local arts agency side, uh, philanthropy and funding, as well as, you know, serving on nonprofit boards and, and the like. So, oh, okay. So you, you graduated from Stanford and undergraduate, but where did you go to law school? I wanted to stay in New York and I was lucky enough to be able to go to NYU law. There were some incredible folks there that I did study with and some I didn't. Um, I will tell you, I, I still hold a really special place in my heart for someone named Derek Bell who taught constitutional law, but really brought um, a critical race lens to it. And everybody wanted to be in his class. In fact, he's considered to be kind of the father of critical race theory. Incredible, incredible man, no longer with us. He's an ancestor now. Uh Um, And then at the time, Brian Stevenson was also there um, when he was first starting his work uh, around uh, criminal justice reform and doing clinics with the law students um, in what you know later we are now now so many of us know as the Equal Justice Initiative and his incredible incredible work. I did not study with him, but I remember 
hearing about um, his incredible work in that in that realm. And I, I just give so much uh, sort of recognition and gratitude. Mm-hmm. So many who from different vantage points, whether using their art or using legal means, um, are really looking at liberation, abolition, and, and justice. Oh, wow. What a, a full and rich background uh, that you would bring to. Uh, so your after you finished law school, uh, when did you, um, what was your next uh, step in the, in the journey that you've been taking so far? So the very next thing was to kind of cut my teeth as a lawyer. And so I spent some time at a law firm in New York City, learning the basics of, of how you actually practice law. Uh, and then after that, gosh, what did happen after that? Oh, I think after that was when I, I said, okay, I knew from like the moment I was in there, I was like, this is not, this is not for me. I need to get back to the arts. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I began to really weave these things together. And I did a fellowship, uh, an arts management fellowship at New York Theater Workshop. They're a nonprofit uh, theater organization that's developed a lot of work that eventually went on to, to many bigger things like Broadway. Uh, that's where the, the show Rent originated. Um, the Broadway show once originated there. And they've also really cultivated a lot of arts administrators, directors, and writers of color. They mm-hmm. have a fellowship that they do uh, within those three categories. So folks like Brandon Jacob Jenkins, uh, who's an amazing uh, playwright and others. Uh, actually, he was in my class oh, wow. as a fellow with me at the time. Um, and so I did that fellowship in arts management and arts administration. Um, and eventually... I got a phone call after that uh, from a good friend of mine saying, you know, I just had lunch with the general counsel at New York City's Department of Cultural Affairs, and they're looking for someone to be this new position, the, the deputy general counsel. Mm-hmm. And I already told them all about you. So you should you should apply. And I thought, what? <laughs> and the funny thing is, this is what's so funny, Eric, is that it had actually not occurred to me what a strong role the public sector government agencies play in supporting the arts. Yeah. Even though when I think back of all of the performances I was in or attended or shows, I went to, that logo, for example, um, here it would be our logo, LA County Department of Arts and Culture, right? right. But there, or, or City of LA's, you know, cultural affairs, there was New York City's cultural affairs, but that little logo had probably been on so many programs and exhibits and things I had been to, I hadn't even put two and two together and realized that this was like a, a really amazing opportunity until I went. Um, and it and it and it really began my career um, in the local arts agency, public sector space. Excellent. And so how long were you there? Almost a decade. Oh. Yeah. Nine years of nine years. Um, and then from and there, from there, you ended up here in L.A., and right? From there, I ended up here. Uh, and that was an amazing moment as well. I, you know, as you, uh, <laughs> there's so many artists and different folks who go to New York for different reasons. And I feel like for a lot of folks who do that, and there's this kind of perennial, like every year or two, you start to be like, now, are we staying here forever? Or like, what are we, what are we doing? And so at the time, my husband and I started having that conversation. And uh, I had just put into the universe, okay, I really love my job. This is great. I've got a bit of a runway. I can keep going. But in the future, should we leave New York, we put into the space two, two places, Chicago, where I'm from, and an incredible place for arts and entertainment, or Los Angeles. Oh. where my husband is from and an incredible place for art and and uh, entertainment. And so uh, literally not long after I, I put that into the universe, not thinking it was for now, like in a few years, you know, um, I got outreach about the role that I later stepped into, um, which was to be the executive director of the LA County Arts Commission. Yes. And one thing led to another and after a series of interviews and visits and it just, was the right thing at the right time. Um, and so many connections to LA. My sister lived in Los Angeles, lived here for almost 20 years. Uh, I had been to Los Angeles many times. I had even been in dialogue with some staff from the Arts Commission about, we were doing a diversity initiative in New York. They started cultural equity and inclusion initiative and we started comparing notes around that 
time. Ah. So I had heard of the work and had been uh-huh. admiring some of the work. So it was just a really incredible kind of moment of serendipity. Fantastic. And uh, L.A. County is the better for it. We have, have you as the director of the uh, L.A. County uh, Department of Arts and Culture. So one of the things I just want everybody to know before we kind of get into sort of what the department uh, does and, and, and supports and so forth is – like you just mentioned, when you first came out, it was the L.A. County Arts Commission, and now it's the L.A. County Department of Arts and Culture. The L.A. County Arts Commission still exists, and I should actually say right now that I'm actually on the Arts Commission presently, the president, and my term ends next month, as it turns out, and I'll be turning it over to the very capable Constance Jokovar, who's my fellow commissioner. So I just wanted to put that out there. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about, so when you first came out, it was the County Arts Commission as one entity, and now it's kind of branched off into two different things, and they both coexist. Can you, can you tell us uh, about that a little bit? Sure, absolutely. And thank you. You've been wonderful as president of the Arts Commission. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, sure. So, uh, you know, these days I like to say we are like a 70-year-old startup. <laughs> a lot of folks don't know. But LA County had the Arts Commission. It was established in 1947 and really began, its name officially was the Music Commission because our role was to make recommendations to the Board of Supervisors for different symphonies and music performances that they should support through funding, in part to increase access to the wonderful you know, uh, activity that is music. Over time, that began to expand from not just music but supporting all kinds of arts and essentially that turned into grant making um, and what now is one of our flagship programs the organizational grant where we fund more than 400 different arts organizations of every artistic discipline all over the county large and small um, provide them with uh, grant funding support and and capacity building and professional development And so all of that was going on. And the first uh, executive director was my predecessor named Laura Zucker. And she was there for 25 years, building and growing that portfolio, working with the appointed arts commissioners so that there's grants. Now there's also a division of arts education to really increase access and equity in arts education and arts learning in school. And now we're also expanding that to focus on out of school and learning and community. And thirdly, uh, a division on civic art, commissioning artists for county projects, usually county capital projects, so permanent works of public art. We also do research uh, that's of meaning to the arts field, and now we, we have as a core thing that we do advancing cultural equity and inclusion. But so much of this had been building, and not long after I arrived, one of the first things on my plate was that the Board of Supervisors wanted to explore whether to create uh, a first ever department of arts and culture for the county of Los Angeles. And through a process and having a consultant provide uh, a structural analysis, they did in fact make that historic decision and transitioned what was then the arts co- operating as the arts commission into the first ever official department of arts and culture for the county of LA. Now, as you say, exactly, there are now two entities because they wanted to retain the appointed arts commissioners and that advisory body. And so now we have the department and we still have the wonderful time, talents, insights, uh, and advocacy of the arts commissioners as the arts commission. So that's where we are. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of incredible that Los Angeles County is this incredible place and the art in Los Angeles has been incredible. And so it's kind of um, an amazing moment to have been part of when um, you know, the leaders that be saw the value in that and wanted to set us up for even more future growth and really firmly cement that the arts should be on par with other departments. So we're now seated around the table with, you know, the Department of Parks or Public Works uh, or Library or Probation or what have you, um, which is uh, just an incredible advancement when you think of it from kind of a policy point of view in the public sector. Absolutely. And I think that's, that's a very important point. And before I explore it a little bit more, I just wanted to point out that the background that's uh, uh, in, in your, in your 
your background, I should say, is one of those works of uh, civic art, correct? Yes, it is. This year, because of the pandemic, we put on our website, uh, which anyone could go to at LA County Arts, uh, and uh, we put on our website a bunch of digital backgrounds that are civic art commissions. And so this one is uh, by Bonnie Rice, um, but we have ones up there from uh, the Golden State Mutual Collection. We have, we have maybe about 12 or so, 12 to 15 different ones. They're available free, uh, so anybody can use them. Excellent. And one other thing I just wanted to point out, as you mentioned, uh, the commissioners are appointed by the L.A. County supervisors. There's five supervisors. Each supervisor gets to appoint three arts commissioners, and that's how it kind of gets set up. And we serve um, the, uh, the county, of course, but also at the, at the behest of the, of the uh, supervisors. And it's a tribute to them that they regard art as such an important component of life in L.A., L.A. County. L.A. County is a huge county area-wise and population-wise, right? And there's so many different people of different backgrounds, not just racial and ethnic, but also geographic, as we've talked about in the meetings and so forth. Uh, And there's a a concerted effort to um, reach literally everyone. And you mentioned cultural equity and inclusion. And I just wanted to do two things. One is to explore that, but also to emphasize how art often gets pushed aside as being sort of insignificant, like a frivolous little nice to have, but not a really essential thing. But uh, as as we've discussed many times, and as we know, uh, I mean, it is is really an important part of the economy for one thing, and I think also for the morale and uh, just overall well being of of all county residents. Can you please uh, expound on that? <laughs> Happy to, although you said it well yourself. <laughs> I I wholeheartedly agree, and um, you know. It, it is funny. Sometimes people say, well, you know, we're, we're, we're in the arts and we're supposed to be storytellers, but we feel like we don't get the story across that the arts, you know, in the words of, in the words of former supervisor, Mark Ridley Thomas, art, the arts matter. Right. Um, And, uh, but it's true. Uh, We now know and do have kind of better ways to, to speak to and show even in studies and reports and everything that the arts are of course, just an invaluable and, uh, incredibly integral part of of humanity and of our existence and a civic society but we also do know that the arts are a huge driver of the economy especially in a place like los angeles um i mean the numbers are actually stagger staggering it's it's an annual output the arts and creative economy of over 200 billion dollars a year it's a huge driver of our of our local economy but of course the arts are not only economic so we know that when people experience the arts they have the opportunity to transform they have the opportunity to shift perspectives they have the opportunity to express themselves and that this can also translate into the kinds of goals and outcomes that often the public sector or philanthropy have even unrelated to the arts so increased social and emotional well-being of students or youth who are involved in art making that's critical you know wanting to stay in school longer having more vibrant communities but to do that it means we have to ensure that everybody has equitable access to the arts um, and that we're all reflected in it right so that's the other thing that's so interesting to me about the notion of cultural equity it's not only the idea that we have cultural resources being distributed equitably all over the county and regardless of low income or being a person of color or where you live, right? But it's also important that the art and culture that we value, that we praise, that we fund, that we uplift reflects all of us. So there's also a representational aspect that it's important that we're representing um, and that we see ourselves represented and that we can use that to learn about others. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I also feel that arts and culture is an incredible way to address root causes of systemic inequity because so much of what is at the heart of of some, some of our societal ills or the systemic racism of our society to me is about othering and really not seeing the deep humanity in one another. And so films, music, art, you know, cultural exchange, these are all theater. These are all ways that 
the more we're embedded with that or the more we see these images, it actually can totally change um, our, our perspective about one another um, so that we don't fall back on stereotypes and assumptions and biases mm -hmm. and see our full humanity and our cultural contributions. Absolutely. And you mentioned the grants. Uh, there's the internship program and there's the civic art program. There's all these different ways that the uh, arts department uh, handles this kind of thing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, about those things? Sure. Well, one of the ones, uh, so on the grants, just you know, to highlight, because sometimes uh, for folks, if they haven't really thought that much about this aspect of the arts, it's helpful to even just hear some examples. So if you have ever heard of or attended, um, you know, anything by East West Players, the longest running theater of color in the United States uh, that features Asian and, and uh, API community, that's a grantee of ours. If you know Lula Washington Dance, that's a grantee of ours, right? If you know the Museum of Latin American Art, that's a grantee of ours. So we are providing grant support to these organizations to help make those programs happen, to help make them uh, you know, viable, help them survive, help them to hire artists. So that's that entire realm of hundreds of arts organizations. Um, but we also are um, you know, doing our part to expand access to creative careers in the arts. And so as you mentioned, the arts internship program and I'm so proud to say we just celebrated our 20th anniversary of that program where we provide paid internships to college students at various arts organizations all around the county. And we have continued to grow it. And in fact, the Cultural Equity and Inclusion Initiative spurred a growth that uh, included outreach and reserving spots for community college students to really ensure we were diversifying the reach as well. And this year, you know, this past year, we are um, funding and supporting internships for 200, over 200, 228, I believe it is, students to get paid work experience and really learn about the arts, expand their networks. Uh, so that's, that's an incredible program. And I'm so proud that we've also been able to pivot all of this, given right now the needs of COVID being virtual and also the high unemployment needs that we see uh, all across society, but especially in, in young folks today. So that's an example of, of career pathways um, and professional development work that we do as well. I'm so glad you, you emphasized that, uh, that it's paid and that it's a kind of a serious thing because I know some of the highly publicized criticism of other, uh, just in general, this whole internship thing is that it just provides a a kind of free labor for some for some companies, but that's not the way it operates. Uh, the way that uh, the uh, department oversees it, it can't it can't operate that way. It has to be of benefit to the uh, internees themselves, and so that's that's really fantastic. Uh, you brought up the pandemic. I, I just want to mention that that's obviously had a great impact. I mean, the headlines are how museums are laying off employees and uh, venues are shut down. If they're shut down, obviously they can't really. Uh, pay uh, their own folks that, that work there and so forth. And we, as the population that consumes these uh, cultural products, we can't enjoy them and have that outlet. So can you talk a little bit about uh, uh, the impact of the pandemic on the, on the arts? Sure. The impact has been staggering. Um, we know that in March, I mean, can you believe it's been a year? Eric? Uh, it's March. amazing. It's amazing to uh, think of that. It's been a year. It's been a year. So last March, uh, you know, performing and other kinds of arts and cultural activities and venues, events, those were the first things shut down even before the official stay at home order. Mm -hmm. Remember movie theaters and performances, that was the first thing that really had to had to close. Yep. And so uh, sort of first hit and, and really hardest hit. We've also seen in some of the data that the arts and creative economy has been some of the hardest, one of the hardest hit industries. Um, and what's amazing is that leading up to this moment, uh, uh, we were seeing exponential growth in the arts and creative economy, including in the fine and performing arts sector, mm -hmm. exponential growth over the last, I'd say nine years or so. Um, and that was sort of stopped right in its tracks. Uh, so venues shut down, uh, no activities, very few activities that could happen. Um, and a lot of artists and culture workers put in limbo because either they needed to be let go or laid off or furloughed. 
or the performance that they might have been contracted to do was then canceled. So a huge impact. And what we've seen is that, you know, so many organizations, uh, many of them tried to pivot to virtual in ways that are, are interesting mm -hmm. and actually help us model new ways new ways of being but we also know those models those business models are not necessarily sustainable yet right very few art forms have a sustainable business model for virtual um or streaming a film clearly clearly uh, film and digital media do yep. music long ago uh right. developed different formats from records to cds to tapes you know a way to essentially copy itself and still earn uh, lots of revenue that way but dance or arts education or other means like that, they may be pivoting to virtual if they have the opportunity yeah. um, and the you know equipment uh, and the access, but often they are not net yet truly um, finding sustainable business models for it. So we see, you know, replicated here also the same, not only this huge shutdown and a shutdown of economic activity, but also the inequities that are, are happening all over um, the country mm -hmm. and all over Los Angeles County with COVID, but also some of that is replicated in the arts as well. A lot of smaller organizations or those led uh, by um, uh, communities of color may not have the same access to um, virtual or their communities they serve don't because of the digital divide. Right. So these are all things to to address, uh, but we we did um, get access last year in 2020 to CARES Act funds yep. that came to LA County, and we were so glad we were able to get the arts, a dedicated part of the County of Los Angeles relief funds, and we did a $12 million CARES Act relief effort for the nonprofit art sector last year. Uh -huh. um, and right now, we're also um, doing a new grant that is for the second district that is really around recovery and expanding the reach of the county to identify new grantees and those that are really part of the cultural fabric of LA in the second district. And we're, I'm also partnering with folks in private philanthropy for a larger regional LA arts recovery fund that's a pooled effort. Um, and in our arts education work, we have a public private initiative uh, that supports arts education called the Arts Ed Collective because it's a collective impact model where we also work public, private, and with other funders. So those are all ways that, um, you know, we've been making additional efforts to stretch, to address the pandemic, to provide relief, um, or to continue and sustain uh, efforts that, that, you know, infuse critical funding uh, into the field. So you mentioned the arts education. I just wanted to spotlight that just for a second. I mean, that I'm assuming goes all the way from, primary to secondary school, uh, does it involve any college level, uh, community college or college level? What, what's the so, span of it, basically? Yeah, so the so the primary focus of the arts education collective is K through 12. Yeah. And is ensuring that all of our youth and students have access to arts learning for mm. all the many reasons we can think of, of why it matters, because we still see that um, largely there is arts happening in the schools, in communities, but we do still see inequity uh, yeah. in that space and not always the same level of access. We also see the need for professional development often for schools or for teachers. Um, and so that effort, we have a number of strategies we use, including uh, in-school strategies, advancement grants to schools for music instruments and to pay for classes, Professional development for teachers is something we're also doing and helping the schools put the arts into their strategic plans. And then we're also out in the community uh, repurposing justice dollars through the means of arts education and youth development as a prevention strategy. Mm -hmm. So primarily serving communities that are, are hard hit by justice right. so that there are positive activities for justice impacted communities and, and youth that really keep them out of the justice system so that they're not going in there in the first place. So that's that's part of the range of the arts education work um, and, uh, and then connecting that to the opportunities for creative career pathways. And all of this sits in the LA County regional blueprint for arts education. That really sets forward the goals and the vision for this work and um, I'm proud to say we 
building on about two years of stakeholder conversations with teachers and artists and youth and uh, philanthropy and, and others, um, we delivered the new regional blueprint for arts education that really centers uh, equity and access and the Board of Supervisors adopted it in fall of 2020. So that's essentially going to guide likely the next decade or more of arts education policy and how we really invest in our creative youth for our future. You know, that's the aspect of it that I really appreciated uh, perhaps the most is that there was an ear to the ground to listen to the very folks that would be the beneficiaries of, of these types of uh, programs and efforts and so forth to find out from them what it is that they feel uh, needs to happen. And I think that, that to me was probably one of the key to the successes of getting it uh, passed and, and to the credit of the supervisors to, to pass it and make it uh, as part of the uh, program. I think it's fantastic. So looking, looking ahead, uh, what, what's, um, what, what's in the future for the LA County Department of Arts and Culture? <laughs> Well, um, I mean, whoo, as you know, there's just so much going on right now uh, and so much evolving because of the pandemic. Right. Um, it's kind of dominating the whole thing, right? Absolutely, yeah. um, because we've got to be responsive to the current moment. Uh, right. And so right now, I feel we're in this moment where we are starting to shift from a frame of more relief how do we get you know relief and we're beginning to step into kind of more of a recovery sense of a frame yeah on all levels and federal level state local levels arts etc um where we're starting to now think about talk about and look at um opportunities to essentially uh reimagine the arts to re-employ artists and creative workers who uh maybe have lost work or have not had opportunities and also to leverage that because as you were saying, the arts are an integral part of our, of our lives. And so the arts are really an integral part of our shared recovery. Yeah. I really believe, you know, in this whole pandemic, we, I think we've really only just begun barely to heal. There's going to have to be a lot of healing oh, yeah. coming out of this. Yeah. So it's not only the kind of economic activity and reopening the arts safely, but how all of that can be used to heal, to reconnect, to address cultural and racial equity, um, and and support vibrant communities is is going to be a key part of the vision. Most immediately, we're definitely focused on reopening. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because the state and the local level, they're coming up with those guidelines that say what the arts can and can't do, and how many people you can have, and and the latest on that is essentially that. Um, uh, there were new changes that will now allow for outdoor performances uh, with restrictions and things of that nature uh, starting next month. So that was a really big deal uh, for the arts uh, on the performing side. We mm -hmm. know the museum folks have been doing everything they can to get ready to open indoor activity because uh, they've only been allowed really to open outdoors for most of this time in Los Angeles County for this past year. Mm -hmm. So that's what's happening on that side. Um, you know, it's yeah, funny too, because the museums, I think uh, one of the arguments I remember reading about is that they say, Hey, listen, you know, because of the art that we have, we have to maintain all these different uh, measures to make sure the art is well preserved and so forth. And that's those same efforts kind of help it make, make it be more um, healthy and safe for humans to be in there. So it seems logical to open up uh, the, the museums for people to come in and, and look around as, as, as far as it's safe, obviously. Yeah. You know, maybe not a hundred percent capacity, but you know, some percentage that's deemed safe. What do you think? Exactly. Well, that's exactly what the museums have been saying is that they've got climate control, many of them, they've got really in, you know, robust uh, sort of HVAC air systems. They have the ability to do temperature taking, they can even limit where you're from. So if, if what we don't want is to draw a lot of out of state visitors, they can say, well, we're only, you know, because of the, the restrictions, uh, we're only allowing, you know, in-state visitors. Um, they can limit the number of people, all of those things. They can even do contact tracing because they can require reservations yeah. and an ability to contact you. So their argument is exactly as you say, which is uh, that's even more than, you know, the malls are doing. <laughs> right. So we want to make sure that we do get the chance to open. And it looks like uh, 
as soon as we move uh, into the next tier, they will be able to put all that into practice um, and open it and uh, open the museums. I think also just to connect to one of your earlier points, we need safe spaces to go and people need opportunities to connect and to reflect in safe ways. And so I think to any degree that the arts are that respite, uh, I think that's, that's going to be really important uh, for everybody going forward. Yeah. I think the pandemic has taught me at least that uh, not having the ability to do all the things I'm used to doing, going to the museums and seeing live theater and so forth, concerts, it reminds me of how much uh, I rely on it, not being able to do it. It's like the, you, you don't miss your water till the well runs dry. I know for me, at least, that's been one of my experiences. And this has taught me how important the arts really are. Of course, with me, it's singing to the choir, obviously. I'm, I'm in the arts. But uh, at any rate, that, that's, that's one of the things that I take from this, from this experience is that how much we really rely on it for not just the economy, like you're saying, but uh, just for everyday sustainability to, to live, to feel whole. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it will be really interesting to see what stays. You know, I was just reading this article on cryptocurrency yeah, and how that's really coming into the art market. Really? Um, it's all of that. And so it'll be really interesting to see how much this kind of digital shift, uh, for example, as just one thing, yeah. uh, shifts. Um, or if there are arts organizations that never did anything outside and were sort of forced to, how much do they maintain that now going forward? That could be new. Yeah, yeah. We, right? We see funders and philanthropists um, with a greater emphasis on, on equity, on cultural and racial equity, mm -hmm. and on supporting artists of color. Will that continue? Yeah. Um, so it, we're at a very interesting place, and I do kind of come from the, the school of uh, never let a good crisis go to waste kind of a thing. Like, let's Whatever are those gains and opportunities or silver linings, you know, let's get them. Yeah, <laughs> Because we need, we need those. Absolutely. By the way, did you see the headline? Uh, I think it was like $69 million for digital digital work of art. Did you see that? Uh, I speak, did. I know. You, you, that's more your realm than mine, that right? Is, your art appraisal and all that. So, so what did you think of that? I just thought that was incredible. I was surprised that uh, it fetched that much money. 69 million. I mean, I have to delve into a little bit more. I just saw the headline, but uh, it was a surprising, uh, surprising development. I think it was yes. the most ever fetched for a digital work of art. That's right. Yeah. I know. It actually made me want to, I just read it this morning. It made me want, <laughs> this is how my brain works. I'm like very like creative. Yeah. Creative. I'm like a secret creative entrepreneur, but who never actually goes and creates any businesses on her. I just have a bunch of ideas. If only I were like, you know, a wealthy celebrity and I had a team, like a development team, I would have all this stuff going on. But, right, right. Because it made me want to run out and call. I had like certain people in mind. I was like, okay, now we need to get like a, a black owned. Let's hustle this thing up, right? <laughs> or a women owned like digital art technology company now right. that has like a portfolio because this stuff is off the chain. And I always just think about, you know, so that's totally not my realm. I mean, I really have very little experience directly in the commercial art market or the auctions or whatever. Um, and so, uh, you know, I find that really fascinating. Yeah. But I also do know that there's some policy pieces around all that that I, I they've been on our sort of radar for a long time and that I actually hope do get changed eventually. Mm -hmm. What am I talking about? I'm talking about nerdy stuff, everybody, like tax law. Why does it matter? Because at some point back in the 60s or 70s, I don't even know why, the United States tax law was changed so that an artist who donates a work only can get the value of the materials right. of that art, whereas a collector Right. who donates that work to a public institution like a museum can actually get the market value. Right. That to me is perverse. <laughs> and the artists don't really get royalties uh, is another related policy. So that it, if it, they the sell their work and then their work is resold, they don't get royalties back on it later for subsequent sales. In the These U.S. Are things that drive me crazy. In the U.S. Yeah, so but do they in Europe? They do in Europe, actually. 
Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. See, that's the kind of stuff that I'm like, we need to, we need to, we need to keep pushing. Yeah, y'all. no, you're right. Pushing. You're right. And as an appraiser, I'm a certified appraiser and I, I have encountered that situation where, as you just pointed out, it doesn't matter what the market value of the work is. If an artist, him or herself, uh, makes the uh, donation, all they can deduct, deduct is the cost if it was a canvas, the canvas, the, the pigments, et cetera. It doesn't Makes seem, no sense. doesn't seem fair. You're right. You're right. And what happened is, so here's the direct result of policy. Immediately we saw a decline in donations of artworks to, you know, museums. And that matters because as much as personal collections matter yeah. and as much as the art market matters, these are the charitable institutions who are holding this work in public trust for all of us. Yeah, preserving it, it, presenting it, correct, telling us about correct. it, researching correct. And it. so fewer works are going into the public realm uh, in that way, and that when artists want to do it, they can't directly do it and get uh, an actual significant tax deduction. They would have to essentially do it through an agreement with you know another person or like go some other route so right. it's really interesting but yeah. absolutely the tool the digital tools and how much this might mean to all of us and how well, we can make sure everybody has access to that yeah uh, it's interesting yeah it really is fascinating when you brought up digital that's what made me think about that uh, auction thing that was kind of surprising but now you know switching back to you personally by the way i just wanted to find out uh do you collect yourself do you collect so, the art or any, at any uh, you know I don't consider myself a collector. I, I absolutely do have art in my home. Um, and many of the pieces have a personal story. Yeah. Um, right. So, uh, for example, uh, years and years ago, I had the, the opportunity to go to Brazil. And uh, so I went to Salvador Bahia. In fact, I've been there twice. Uh, I was there once with Urban Bushwomen as a dancer. Oh. First time I ever went. Okay. Um, and in fact, that was the trip now that I think about it. I believe where I got the art um, and I was walking, I can't remember what I was doing. I was walking along, you know, being like a, <laughs> a little bit of a tourist while we were there. Right. And there was an artist, uh, a man, and he was selling these original woodblock prints ah. of various orishas uh -huh. in different colors. And they were just incredible. And I thought they were so incredible that I bought, I think, four or five. I bought five. Oh. I might have even bought six and given one as a gift that I now later I'm like, I wish I still had that. <laughs> um, I bought them and brought them back to the United States. And they're some of my favorite artwork. And you still have um, them? Oh, yeah. I have them. They're framed. Uh, in fact, um, there's one that I never did frame that I'm going to frame to put in my daughter's room, but I, I still have them. They're incredible. I love them. Ah, and so I have things like that. Oh, actually, explain to our viewers and listeners what an Orisha is. Oh, good point. So Orishas relate to spiritual figures. They're kind of almost like uh, demigods uh, in other cultures, essentially in African uh, diaspora and cultures. And so very, very big in Brazil and Bahia. Salvador Bahia is one of the largest concentrations of people from the African diaspora outside of Africa, yeah. um, you know, owing to the slave trade and other things. And so, you know, a lot of, it's kind of like, you know, like in many places, a lot of people used to think of, maybe they still do, when they think of Brazil, they just think of kind of Giselle Bündchen or like whoever it is. They think of these <laughs> sort of like very fair skinned yeah, yeah. models, and straight hair. but there's actually a huge Afro-Brazilian uh, community yeah. and so it's an amazing place to go for music and and dance and food and uh yes the orishas are part of their practice and so and their spiritual um you know stories and really storytelling yeah. as well like folk stories feature these orishas and so um yeah that's incredible so that's that's like an example of something i would have i have another piece that honestly i got from like my friend's mother was getting rid of this. They were like, oh, we're selling some of these different furniture items and different things. This is back yeah. in New York. And I was like, I, I, this, can, what about this? I want this. It was just like this yeah. huge canvas, uh, stretched canvas with a white wood frame. It's not even covered. It has like no glass on it. Yeah. And they got it on some kind of a trip. Oh. And uh, and literally I was like, I want it. They were like, okay. And they drove it for, for me like to my apartment. And we <laughs> brought awesome. it all the way here to LA. So everything has like a personal story. And then I will say I have a lot of um, 
posters because of my uh, history in theater, et cetera, because every Broadway show makes a poster. Ah. So I have signed like the whole original cast of Mamma Mia poster or That's I have awesome. an Urban Bush Women poster or, you know, the National Tour of Rent signed by everybody. So I have that kind of thing. And my husband was in the music industry. <laughs> so he has posters and gold record plaques and like a whole thing of um, VIP like uh, passes from right. like shows. He also has a whole closet. He will kill me for saying this. He also has a whole closet of like <laughs> hot, like cool kicks because when you're in the music business, you never, you may get like cool sneakers, you know, oh, yeah. when you're, especially uh, he was a marketing executive for like a lot of rock and rap groups. Um, so we have, we have kind of an interesting collection. I you guess. Just, don't put it in quotes. You're a collector <laughs> for sure. Come on. No, no apologies necessary. I mean, that's the thing I talk to people. Sometimes people think in order to call yourself a collector, you have to have these multi-million dollar Picassos and uh, p- paintings from the old masters and stuff, but that's just one form of collecting. You know, what you're doing is, is wonderful. It has a personal tie. I think that's fantastic and no, no apologies should be offered at all. But I love it. Well, thank, thank you. you. I feel good about that now. You I should. feel it because I I I didn't think of it as a collection. It is a collection. <laughs> I'm here to tell you. So I'll let just um, from now on consider it a collection. That's my command. <laughs> yes, will do. Will do. Okay. Well, listen. Uh, Kristen, this has been fabulous. I really appreciate you taking time out. I know this is kind of like a uh, middle of the day almost. You took time out of your schedule to participate in this. And thank you so much for being a guest and sharing your perspective on Eric's perspective. Thank you so much. I love it. Thank you. Thank Wonderful. you. Thank you, everybody else, for tuning in. And please don't forget to subscribe. Mm-hmm.